All right, guys. So welcome to, first of all, this is weird. Never in a million years thought that I'd be doing a YouTube channel. But um, after thinking about it a little bit and all that stuff, I decided, hey, what the heck? Because, you know, I got something to say. And a few people have asked me to share my experiences as well as I have shared my experiences before. And so I figured, why not give it a shot? So for those of you who don't know, my name is Erin and I'm going to be talking about that one time when I was in a cult. So that's going to be the name of this mini series, that one time when I was in a cult. And I'm just going to share my experiences there as well as eventually share how I've been since leaving. So today I'm going to explain a little bit about the cult that I was in as well as how I got there because there's this really profound quote. I don't know who it was by. Maybe I saw it on Instagram, but it said, no one ever joins a cult. And that was really... It was simple but very profound because that's true like no one join no one joins an organization think you know what i think i'm going to join a cult today or that's always something i've wanted to cross off my bucket list uh but there's a lot of things that kind of go into that and then things happen so that's what this is going to be about this mini series so today i'm just going to be talking about like i said the first like my intro introducing the cult that I was a part of as well as how I got there. So I was a part of a religious group organization called the International Church of Christ or ICOC for short is what people call it. So I'll probably go in between both calling it ICOC and Inter I'm not gonna call it International Church of Christ. That's too much. But um but yeah, so essentially, for those of you who aren't familiar, and then maybe even for those of you who are familiar, the ICOC is an inner, as the name would imply, an international church movement uh, based, like they're non-denominational is what they claim, uh, claim to be, but they're also like a break off from like the regular sector of Church of Christ. So kind of like there's Presbyterian and Baptist Church of Christ is a denomination as well, but the ICOC kind of started from the the main Church of Christ. So And that long pause was because I, I found myself saying we. And I actually left the ICOC in 2020. And so even as I talk, even though it's been, I guess it would be three years in November for me that I left, I really want to make sure that I'm not saying stuff like we because I'm not there anymore. And that's not, that's not where I am. And so... Yeah, but anyways, so the ICOC, like I said, is they have churches all over the world and the parts, the churches that I was a part of specifically are located in Hampton Roads, Virginia and in Richmond, Virginia. So the front, the one that I got that I was in the most was in Hampton Roads. So like Virginia Beach, Norfolk. Hampton like 757 so it's called the Hampton Road Church of Christ and they have different locations even there within that area and then I was in the Greater Richmond Church of Christ which is located in Richmond Virginia which is where I'm from so how did I get there so I grew up in Richmond family family full of pastors to be honest so I was in church I grew up in the church not ICOC but I just grew up in like Christian church black church in general like that's just from birth so when I was 
in high school, my senior year of high school, I was applying to colleges like seniors generally do. I was applying to colleges and I remember just kind of being in a really weird place in my life. And I was in a place where um, I was really questioning my sexuality. Oh, I'm also bisexual, by the way. So I was questioning my sexuality a lot and growing up in church in black church and in a black family, being gay by anything else was off. That was like the worst thing you could do or be. So um, for me, I internalized that a lot growing up because I was a goody two shoes out of all of my friends. Like I was, I was in church multiple times a week. I was reading my Bible multiple times a week. Like I was a friend. I was like, oh, don't cuss. Like that was the type of person that I was growing up. Um, but yeah, my senior year of high school was just kind of in a rough place and was kind of like, ah, oh, I think I'm going to take a break from God and from church. Um, and, but then applying to schools and I remember kind of making a plea deal with God at this, at this point in my life. And I was like, all right, God, like if you get me, cause I really wanted to go to ODU, Old Dominion University. I really wanted to go to ODU. So I said, God, if you get me into ODU, I'll live my life out for you. And that was kind of like my prayer that back then, even when I prayed, I had, when I prayed, I had no intention of living out. And so get the acceptance letter. It's like, thanks God, appreciate it. But then again, like I didn't really have like the intention of living it out, but I ended up kind of giving it some thought. And by the time that I got to school, I was okay. Like I do really want to find a church. I want to find a campus ministry to be a part of. And um, yeah, like I just, that's just kind of where things were for me. And so I was, my freshman year in college was in the marching band at ODU. Um, and for those of you wondering, I played a baritone or a euphonium. It's the same thing, but that's what I played. It's the least known instrument in the band. So there's that. Look it up. But so as a part of band camp, I had to be on campus early. So even back then, I was the first one. I was the first one in my dorm. Um, and I was the like only one aside from my RA in my dorm for like a week. And so um, when I was on campus for band camp, uh, most of my section, the low brass section, like was guys, but it was only one other girl. It was me and one other girl. Um, and so we naturally became friends because, you know, the guys were truthfully in band, like a little bit odd. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to change people's names out. So just out of respect. So we're going to call her Ashley. So Ashley, me and Ashley, um, became really good friends and she's actually the one who introduced me to the ICOC um, and to Hampton Roads. So she was a member in the campus ministry and I just remember one day or like for the first week of class, she asked me, hey, look, you know, you should come with me to church, yada, yada. And for me as a freshman who was really trying to make sure that I was passing my classes on the first week and getting my, my work done, I was like, no, like, I don't think you know, like I have homework, I have this and that. And the second week of class, the second week of the semester, she went, she asked me again, and she was, cause we got out of band practice early. So she was like, Aaron, like you have to come now. Um, like, I know you don't have anything to do. So I was like, all right, cool, whatever. I'll check it out. And so I checked it out and I remember, uh, it was a, service strictly for campus student for like people on campus like students and um it's what they called a midweek service so it was right smack dab in the middle of the week so I think it was on it had to have been on a Wednesday so I came and I remember being there and it was people my age and they just seemed really gung-ho for God like that was what drew me in, honestly. So again, like you never join a cult. What drew me to that campus ministry, the Hampton Roads campus ministry, 
no, Hampton Roads Student Fellowship is what they're called, um, was that they looked gung ho for God. And even looking, I was like, man, like this is really cool. Like I've never really seen that. Even for me growing up my whole life in the church, I saw a lot of hypocrisy. So I was like, I've never seen people my age be like down for God like this. Like, hmm, like this, this is pretty cool. Um, and someone came up to me afterwards and like people engaged with me and they were talking to me, asking me questions, trying to learn, you know, like know who I was, all that stuff, just being really friendly. And someone, um, a woman came up and asked me, she was like, Hey, like, you know, after talk, getting to know me and stuff, she was like, would you like to study the Bible? Um, and like, you know, do some Bible studies. So for me, I was like, yeah, like, that seems cool because I'm equating, I'm thinking that this was like a group Bible study where, you know, we just, we all discuss the Bible and stuff like that. Because mind you, prior to this, like I was reading the Bible as a teenager <clears throat> pretty much every day. Like that's just what was going on. And so the next day I remember getting to the Bible studies, the woman who asked me to, to study the Bible, she wasn't, she wasn't even there. It was some more people that were there and, um, and Ashley, I had the sheet down cause we're also going to say the names. Um, Ashley was there and a few other people were there as well. And I remember like the first Bible study, people kind of went around and they gave their testimonies or they told about their lives before Christ. And so, and then the woman who was leading it, she was maybe a, a year older than I am. So I was like 18 at the time. So she had to have been 19. She was 19. Yeah. Um, I'm going to call her Emma. Again, I literally have a sheet to make sure I'm not saying people's names because I'm going to forget. Um, but yeah, Emma was like, yeah, Aaron, after telling her her story, she was like, so what's your story? And I was like, I don't have one. Cause I'm like, I don't, I do not know y'all. I'm not about to sit up here and tell y'all my life. That's just not what's happening. So, um, we go through, we do the Bible study and it's interesting because a few years later, uh, Emma went and she told me, she was like, yeah, Aaron, like the first time that we met, like I knew that you were religious and she was like, uh, I just, she was like, because I, when I opened my Bible, I had markings and things were highlighted and all this stuff in there. And it was like annotated, all that stuff. And she said, when I saw that, I knew she was like, I skipped the first Bible study that, you know, we usually do. Like I went straight to, you know, like this, to the discipleship study, which I'll talk about the studies more in a second, because I had to prove to you that you weren't a Christian. And now looking back, I'm like, dang, like that's really, again, like she did not know me. And that's what she felt like she needed to prove just because I had markings in my Bible. And so um, what I remember about that Bible study was uh, Emma reading Matthew 28, verse I think, 28 through 30. Um, which it goes through and talks about like, go therefore and baptize uh, all nations and all this stuff. So they're, they're going through and they're making reference to this scripture and they're asking me these questions and something that they do a lot in the ICOC and when they do these Bible studies and like try to hook you in, is they ask what's called leading questions. So with the leading questions that they were asking me, um, she was like, so have you ever helped someone become a Christian before? And I remember I was like, no, I've invited people to come to church before, but I've never, you know, asked, like, I've never helped someone become a Christian. Um, and then, and she even asked, she was like, well, like, what does your church look like? Because our church is multi-ethnic and in here it says all nations. Um, and I was like, well, you know, my church is primarily black, you know, yada, yada. And she was like, well, can that truly be, again, like those leading questions to make it seem like yes or no? Like, well, can this, can that truly be the true church? Like uh, if it's not representing all nations, you know, stuff like that. Um, so like, 
the ICOC is very heavy on scriptures, which, which again was something that drew me to them, but they use it in ways to manipulate like that. And so it got to the point where as we're looking at the scriptures, then she started questioning my family and she was like, because again, family full of preachers, like my family's in heavily in the church, both sides. And she was like, well, like I know you said that your family is like heavy in the church. Has anyone ever, have you ever seen a scripture? Has anyone ever taught this to you? And I was like, well, I'm like, I don't really remember. I'm like, I'm sure they have. And she was like, well, if they haven't taught this to you, can they really be, be Christians? And so I'm like, you know, and so they're like showing me scriptures and all this stuff. And like I said, that scripture was the only one I remember them looking at with me. But I know that there were times after that where, and even when I went later on after I got inducted into the cult, um, that we were trained to ask questions like that. So there's another um, scripture with the Bereans. And again, I'm going to try to put all these scriptures. And so, you know, it says the Christians were called, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And so that was a scripture that was used. And they were like, well, do you consider yourself to be a Christian? The first one would say yes, oftentimes. And like, what about a disciple? Like, would you consider yourself to be a disciple? And the person, like, and I remember saying, well, no, because it's not a term that's used often. But anyways, like it was just different things like that, where that they made you question using scripture because they were well versed in scripture or whatever to try to make you doubt what it was that, you know, you knew and all this stuff. So I remember after my first Bible study being convinced that, man, like maybe I'm not a Christian. I remember calling up my best friend, Taylor, and I was like, Taylor, like, I don't think I'm a Christian. And she was like, well, if you're not a Christian, I don't know what I am. Because again, like how much, I, like even as a teenager, I was just in the church and going to youth groups, even during my lunch break. Like that was just, that was just what I was doing. And so, and I remember calling my grandma as well. My grandma's like, well, what are you talking about? Like, that doesn't make any sense, Aaron. Like, you know that you're a Christian. Um, but yeah, so I continued to, to study the Bible and do different Bible studies. There was this one point where they have what's called the sin study. And there are two parts of the sin study. There's the first part. And then there's obviously the first, the first part. And then the second part, the first part generally is this consisted of using different scriptures and I'll try to post the ones that I remember them using specifically. Um, but they did it with the main point of helping you to see that you're separated from God. So I think it was like Isaiah, maybe Isaiah 52, something like that. I'll have to look it up. Um, and then, like I said, I'll post it here, but, um, but yeah, so the whole purpose was to help, you to see that you are separated from God. So the scripture was made reference to like the arm of the Lord is not too short um, to reach nor his ear too dull to hear, but your sins are separating you from God. So they go and they make this like drawing because someone as, as you are in the Bible studies, there's a person who's leading the Bible studies Then there's a person who is writing notes so that you can pay attention to everything that they're saying. So you go through and they would write literally like a brick wall. And you guys will be able to see my Picasso work. Um, But yeah, it'll literally be like a brick wall. And that was Rush, obviously. Isn't this great? But yeah, a brick wall. And they would say that every time that you sin, you're building up a wall of of sin against God. And so then they'd say, I remember them drawing like a picture of me and a picture of God. And they were like, if you're, let me make myself have hair so you can tell who's who. Um, But I remember them, that's me. 
and this is God. Uh, but I remember them kind of using the analogy. Well, if you were to try to talk to someone through a brick wall, brick wall, could they hear you? Again, the leading questions. And I was like, well, no, like I suppose not, you know, um, but yeah. And essentially what they were trying to get me to see was that like, hey, like there's nothing that you can do kind of. And I, in, in retrospect, I think this is a pivotal point because it's here where they kind of hook and sink people was with the sin study. Because even after that first part of the sin study, they're like, okay, well, next time, kind of like a TV episode, like, all right, well, next time we'll talk about how to like tear that wall down. Um, but, but even before you do that, like for the part two of the sin study, what they what what they asked me to do and what they often ask people to do is write a sin list. And so you'd be like, what? A sin list? But yeah, like a sin list. Like my they went through and they gave a few scriptures. Ooh, excuse me. They gave a few scriptures that we were supposed to that I was supposed to look through and I was supposed to write down any remembrance that I had of those sins. Um, so yeah. And I remember for me, like going through and cause I was really big into, like I would journal and stuff a lot. And so I remember coming back with like seven pages of, well, I think at first I wrote a sin list and I came into the Bible study and they were like, no, like this isn't, this isn't enough. Like this is not like you, you're not being vulnerable. Like you're not being deep. And even um, one of the girls, she was, she led the campus ministry at the time, um, or co-led it. I'm going to call her Sarah. Uh, Sarah was in my Bible studies at this time. And uh, she was just like, yeah, so like, you're not going deep enough. And she would call me Miss Vague because I was vague with my sin. And, you know afterwards I went and got lunch because at this at this point in time there's now three people in my bible studies there's Ashley the girl who invited me out who was at who I was in band with um Sarah who led the campus ministry with you know another guy but she, um Sarah and then Emma and Emma led my bible studies and so you know at this point um after that Bible study where my sin list was not enough, I went to dinner with, uh, with Emma and Emma was, you know, we were talking and, um, I forgot how, but because, because again, like they were showing me scriptures and I was able to see it. It was different because I saw them living it out outside of church. And I don't think I had ever really seen that before. Like most of the times, especially for people who are young, it was like you act one way in church and you act one way outside of church, but they act the same all around, you know, and they knew the Bible and all this other stuff. So for me, I'm like, dang, well, maybe I just don't know. You know what I mean? And so um, having dinner with Emma after the study and I remember like at that point feeling really comfortable to come out to her. Um, and I was afraid again, because I'm like, this is a church, like how will they perceive me, all this stuff. And I remember her being really appreciative of me coming out to her. And she was like, okay, but like now, Aaron, you're going to have to tell everyone else because, you know, like, like you're being vague in your studies. And um, she was like, and you're being, you're being vague in your studies. And, if you don't open up more, then we're going to have to stop. Um, and I felt really torn by that because prior to that, I think I had only come out to one, maybe two people in my life. And the person that I did come out to was my best friend back in high school and, or one of my best friends in, she kind of stopped talking to me not too long after I came out. So, you know, it was just kind of a lot. Um, but yeah, so I was pressured to coming out 
for the Bible study. And so I did, I came out to the women in my Bible study and Sarah, you know, who led the campus ministry when I told her, she was like, Aaron, thank you so much for sharing that. And she was like, actually, I kind of figured that the first time that we met. Mind you, I'll give you a breakdown. So the first time that, that she and I met um, was the first time that I came out to, like I came out to a midweek event on campus. And like I said earlier, I had just come from band camp. It was August. It was August. I had on some basketball shorts and a shirt. And I think my hair was like up in a ponytail and I, I didn't have locks at that point, but, um, but yeah, so that was the first time she saw me fresh out of band camp or out of band practice, um, in the August heat. <laughs> and she said that, and she apologized years, years later for that. But like, that was just kind of, again, like, it's like, what, you know, um, but she went and she told me, well, Aaron, like as a part of your repentance, you can't wear any sweatpants. So sp like specifically what she said, you can't wear sweatpants and you can't wear any sports clothes because like you don't want anyone to be able to know that you're gay. And I remember being like, you know, like just really confused um, and really insecure. Cause I'm like, okay, first of all, she already told me that she thought I was gay the second that she saw me, but then two, like a part of my repentance and me getting close to God, like you're saying that I need to not wear sweatpants anymore or, and I didn't listen to that, but um, it just kind of was confusing for me. And so it was, and I, I will point, cause like point out, like, even as, even as I'm talking about these things, it just reminded me of how it seems like there was, it was never enough. Like there was always something else that someone needed to do or else he couldn't move on to the next Bible study or whatever. So eventually I came back to the, the sin study and wrote, and I was like, Hey guys, like a guy said, I wrote seven pages in my journal. Yeah. And so they're like really excited. Um, so like, wow, she, you know, went really deep. So I remember reading them what I had wrote or whatever. And they still were like, this isn't deep enough. Like you're not being vulnerable. I was like, bro, like seven pages I had journaled out. Um, but eventually we did end up moving on in the, in the Bible studies. And, um, it was time for, cause the, the goal for the Bible studies is for the person to get baptized. And once a person becomes baptized then they are officially a part of the church, um, which I think it's like that in other, at least for Baptists, I think um, it's like that. Like you have to get baptized and then you're officially a part of like the church and some churches at least. Um, but for them, that was like, that was the goal from the first Bible study all the way until the end is to get that person to get baptized and then become a part of the church. So, you know, it's time for me to get baptized. And I was like, okay, like, I think I'm ready. And, you know, they, they agreed. They thought that I was ready to get baptized. And so I'm like, all right, cool. Like, I think I'd like to get baptized this Sunday at church. And that was not good enough for them. And they're like, well, Aaron, like, why? Why do you think, I think it was maybe like a Tuesday. Let's say it was a Tuesday I came to this, this conclusion. Um, and they're like, well, Aaron, if you die tomorrow, if Jesus comes back tomorrow and like, you're not going to heaven, you're not going to be saved. Um, and I was like, wait, what? You know, and I wanted to wait till Sunday because I was excited. I wanted my parents to come. I wanted my grandparents to come to see me get baptized. And um, at first they didn't quite understand because I got baptized when I was five. But I'm like, no, like, I really understand what this means now. Like, I want to do this for me. And so um, I plan to get baptized on Sunday at church. But again, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't 
the answer that they wanted. And I remember going to going to church, going to a midweek service. So it was a Wednesday at this point. And I had people come up to me that I had not spoken to, mind you. I had not spoken to. And they were like, Aaron, so like I heard that you're, you know, really close to getting baptized and that you want to get baptized on Sunday. Like, why on Sunday? You should, you know, like you should get baptized like as soon as you possibly can. You know, and they made reference to a scripture of like a pig in the squalor or something like that. Like you're still like you're still dirty and filthy and all this other stuff. Like and again, they kept bringing up, well, if Jesus were to come tomorrow, like you wouldn't be saved, like you wouldn't be saved, like you'd go to hell, essentially. And um, and they weren't saying it in like a like you're going to hell, but they were it was more of like here and concern of like no like you have to be eager like you have to um even using scriptures about like repentance like eager to see ju- eager to see justice done like you know all of these different things um and and so like afterwards I was thinking I was like well maybe and they and they asked me they're like well why do you want your family to be there that's what they said why do you want your family to be there like are is, is this you being a people pleaser like, what does your salvation have to do with your family? And um, they're like, you know, remember, like the scriptures say that you must hate your mother, father, sister, brother, um, and all of that stuff. Because, yes, that was a scripture that was used to, like, get you. That's a scripture that they use to not literally make you hate your family and that's not even what Jesus was talking about but like for you to prioritize the church so much that it looks like you hate your family and so um so yeah I remember going home in my dorm calling my parents up that night and I was like hey so I I really think I'd like to get baptized tomorrow instead and they my dad was like why I remember my mom was just silent and I was like, because if I die tomorrow, like, I'm not. So you see, I was just kind of like, at this point, I was brainwashed, sad to say. Um, but I, I really wanted my family to be there. But I was like, you know, like, I don't, like, for me, I thought, I'm like, this is my salvation on the line. Like, what if Jesus does come tomorrow? What if I do die tomorrow? Like, I don't want to die and go to hell. And so I told my parents that. And I was like, well, I don't want to go to hell. Like, if Jesus comes tomorrow. I remember one of my parents asking me, well, like, do you plan to die tomorrow? And I was like, no, you know, like, and I could tell that they were concerned, you know. Um, And my mom was like, well, we really wanted to come see your baptism. And, you know, it was just like, I I could tell that she felt really torn and sad about the whole thing. And and so, you know, we hung up. And the next morning, my mom just texted me and she was like, Aaron, like, do what you need to do for your relationship with God. And so, yeah, that happened. And I texted the girls later that day, um, Emma and Sarah, because Ashley had gotten kicked out of my Bible studies um, because she was not doing well spiritually, which essentially we'll talk about that on another episode of what that means. But they had kicked her out of my Bible studies because they didn't think she was being helpful and because um from my understanding because she they they consider her to be a weak christian in the faith um so yeah she wasn't in my bible studies anymore but yeah so i called sarah and emma and was like hey so i think i'm ready to get baptized today um and they called everybody in the campus ministry and I had like a ton of people at my baptism. Um, my parents weren't there. My family weren't there. Um, I had, I think my grandparents like FaceTimed in or whatever. And I spoke to them like after I got baptized, but, but yeah. And everyone like shared nice things about me, even people I didn't know. And so it just felt like, a real community like wow okay these people care about me 
and I'm here. Like they stopped whatever they were doing to come see me get baptized. And like now I'm officially a Christian. And because that's something that, that like in the ICOC they believe is that baptism is necessary for salvation. So like when you get baptized based off of Acts 2.42, like, so once you get baptized then you're officially a Christian, but what they also didn't really, well, they, I'm pretty sure because I've heard it worded differently. Like for me, they didn't say, Hey, like, and you are getting baptized into the ICOC. Cause I did hear that when I was in other people's Bible studies, but for me, they didn't. I think they just said that like, Hey, like you're a member of this church and like you have, like you go into this church essentially. But again, for other people whose Bible studies I was in years later, even months. Yeah. Like years later, um, they said you are getting baptized into the ICOC. But again, that wasn't my experience. Um, so yeah, that was my, that was my experience studying the Bible. Um, and I will say as well, there was one point when I was studying the Bible where, um, someone that I met on campus who wasn't a part of the church, but I just knew, knew her from around. She, it was the first time I ever heard Hampton Roads being mentioned as a cult. So, and then I'm going to wrap up because this is getting kind of long, but I remember talking to her, we were just hanging out one day and she was like, I think my roommate is in a cult. And I was like, mm-hmm. That sounds scary. Like, you know, she's like, you know, she's a part of this campus ministry. And I was like, what part of, what campus ministry is she in? And she was like the Hampton Road, something, something. And my heart like skipped a beat. And I said, no, that's what I'm a part of. Um, and she's like, oh, well, maybe that's, I was like, it's the Hampton Road Student Fellowship. And she was like, yeah, but that's it. She's like, well, maybe it's not a cult, but like, she just acts really weird. And so I was like, that was the first time that I ever heard um, the Hampton Roads Church of Christ um, or the ICOC be alleged as a cult. And so I went actually, um, and because ironically I was meeting up with Sarah, who again, she lead, she led the campus ministry at that time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I was like, Sarah, you will never, you'll never know what, what this girl just said. She was like, what? And I was like, I was talking to this girl and she said that um, that this was a cult. And she didn't flinch. And she was like, yeah, people have called us that before. And I still remember that. I remember where I was on campus. Um, and we were walking at ODU, like, we were walking um, and she was like, no, people have called us that before. And she like explained to me like the history of the letter in 2003 um, very briefly. And she was like, but you know, like don't be alarmed because we've changed a lot since then. Like people have gone after repentance. Um, churches have gone after repentance and that's not how we are now. And so and I think she even encouraged me to look, up the ICOC, like the stuff that was on the news. And so for me that, I ain't gonna lie, it freaked me out a little bit. Um, And I think ever since then, that was like in the back of my head, but because she was transparent when I talked to her about it and she was like, yeah, like that's how it was. And it was really bad, but we're not like that anymore. I was like, okay, all right. Well, like there's been some change and repentance, like no church is perfect. Okay, but then still in the back of my mind, I was like, well, like, keep an eye out, you know, because I don't want to be a part of no cult. And so I did look, you know, look it up a little bit. Um, But I was still, you know, I was like, well, that's in the past. Like, she's, you know, she's, that's in the past. And I wasn't seeing those same things in my face, which as you hear the story, you're probably like, but wait, how? But it's kind of like, it's kind of like 
when someone is in a relationship and you know let's say the guy uh there's a guy and a girl that are that are dating and the ex comes up and says hey like watch out for dude like he's a little toxic you know and you're like okay like I'll watch out but then as you're with your boyfriend like you never see those characteristics and so it's just like huh all right well maybe that was her experience with him but like I'm not seeing those things like not saying that those things aren't there but like when I'm with him I don't see those things and so that was kind of me with the ICOC at that time and with Hampton Roads like Hampton Roads Church at that time was okay like I know that people have said crazy things but like that's not my experience I'm seeing people who are loving I'm seeing people who are in the Bible. I'm seeing people who want other people to become Christians. Like, that's what I'm seeing. That's what I'm seeing, you know, and I'm seeing people who are in community, like that are having fun. And like, that's what I saw. And so it was kind of crazy to hear the other stuff. So yeah, that's just a little bit about my experience studying the Bible. Um, Next time, I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened afterwards so again like I was there from 2013 and I left in 2020 so stay tuned for all of that um thanks for watching